double seam. All right. 235. Once like a bird in prison, I dwell. No freedom from my sorrow I felt. But Jesus came and listened to me, and glory to God, he set me free. He set me free, yes, he set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound my Jesus to see for glory to God. He set me free. Now I am climbing higher each day. Darkness of night had drifted away. My feet are planted on higher ground and glory to God. I'm homeward bound. He set me free. He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see for glory to God. He set me free. Goodbye to sin and things that confound. Not of this world shall turn me around. Daily I'm working, I'm praying to, and glory to God I'm going through. He set me free, he set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see. For glory to God, he set me free. All right. 279. 279. As I journey through the land, Singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow. Many arrows pierced my soul, for I'm without within. But my Lord leads me on, through him I must win. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Yes, I'll pass home at last, ever to rejoice. When in service for my Lord, dark may be the night. But I'll cling more close to him, he will give me light. Satan snared may vex my soul, turn my thoughts aside. But my Lord goes ahead, leads whatever be tied. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. When in valleys low I look toward the mountain high, and behold my Savior there leading in the fight, with a tender hand outstretched toward the valley low, guiding me I can see as I onward go. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, 
ever to rejoice when before me billows rise from the mighty deep then my lord direct my bark he does safely keep and he leads me gently on through this world of foe he's a real friend to me oh i love him so oh i want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice cares all past home at last ever to rejoice you may be seated I hope that's your prayer tonight. I'm looking forward to seeing him. How about you? It's good to be here tonight. Appreciate each and every person that's with us, those that are watching via live stream. Thank you for being here as well. Um, it was interesting. Uh, uh, some friends of ours, dear friends of ours in Shelbyville, uh, actually uh, watched the service today. Evidently, they weren't having church, and so they watched in on our service today. And you got to know Brent. Uh, he and I have been friends since my days in, at UT. And Brent has one of the driest uh, and most hilarious sense of humors of anybody that I've ever met. He and I hit it off just uh, immediately. He was in our wedding. We, uh, I got the opportunity to be in his uh, several years later. Uh, and um, uh, he sent a letter uh, right after our wedding. He sent a letter, and it was the, it was the epistle of Brent the herdsman, he raised his cattle, by the way, and he's an engineer, but he and his father raised cattle, said the epistle of Brent the herdsman to Timothy, uh, and he wrote it in King James English, and that was one of the funniest letters I've ever read in my life, and, and there's one line in it, one of the guys, uh, one of the, my other friends from UT, Derek, was in the wedding, and he ordered, uh, Derek ordered a uh, prime rib rare, is how he wanted his prime rib. And so in that letter, uh, Brent put in that letter, <laughs> he said that the, so, somehow he, wor he got it worked into the letter and he said that the steak that Derek ordered hadn't seen the fires of hell or any other source as far as the east is from the west. <laughs> he just, you just got to know Brent. And so anyway, today he sends me this. Janice and I enjoyed listening to your service this morning. I searched Strong's, being Strong's Concordance, and couldn't find in Scripture one of your emphatic points. Where does the Bible say that church bulletins must be on gray paper? Must be the NAS or the NIV or something? Hope Sabrina gets to feeling better. Love to you all. So, again, that's just typical Brent. Uh, but I appreciate them <laughs> joining us in the service this morning. And appreciate you being here tonight, each and every one of you, whether it's live stream or YouTube. Just thank you for being uh, together with, as far as our announcements go, Pastor Deacon Fellowship, and that is at 6.30 tomorrow, not 6 o'clock. I don't know. It says 6 o'clock in the bulletin, and I just read it that way. Uh, but it's actually 6.30 tomorrow night. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Fellowship dinner this Wednesday, chicken sandwiches, potatoes, and pudding. Uh, ladies lunch, br uh, lunch bunch, Friday, January 26th at 1 o'clock at Perkins. Any issues or questions there, see Miss Geneva. Uh, youth groups, the date for the Wilds will be June the 3rd through the 8th. Register before February 1st uh, to get the early bird uh, discount there. Again, any information you need there, see Miss Christie. Community outreach, we've got the Easter egg hunt coming up, as we said this morning. Uh, we've got plenty of the plastic eggs. We just need the little candies and things to pick, stick in those. So uh, start bringing those as quickly as you can so they can start getting that done. We've got, like we've got tons of the plastic eggs. We just need uh, the stuff to go on the inside. If you're going to bring gifts or anything like that, if you've got a gift card, uh, please, nothing more than $10. That way you know, it's kind of fair to everybody uh, if you want to bring a gift card for that as well. Uh, Operation Christmas Child, small toys, stuffed animals, and small balls. If it doesn't have a pump, that's okay, according to Miss Christie. There's a box of about 20 of those pumps, so that we should be good there. 
uh, the Giving Hearts Ministry, of course, the snack foods, bottled waters, blankets, uh, and then the clothing items that we've been talking about, especially uh, as we've had all the cold uh, weather and continual, you know, we've, we've still got a couple of months of, uh, of winter, so we need to be keeping that in mind. Also, the sign-up calendar is out there now. Uh, we've been using that initially for those who wish to visit Brother Tim Sally. Uh, but uh, the uh, Soldiers of Grace is also expanding their ministry into visiting with the widows and widowers and shut-ins. And, and so that calendar is going to be used for all of that if you want to sign up on particular days to go visit particular people. That would be a blessing and a help. Uh, there was one other. Oh, yeah, the roads. I knew there was one that got thrown at me uh, that I didn't have written down. Uh, the, uh, the, the road from... Uh, uh, the Lincoln Street connection onto John B. Dennis uh, down to Moreland Drive will be closed next weekend. Uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They're going to try to knock that out and, and get a, as much of that stuff done as they can. Uh, so please keep that in mind. If you come that way to church, you, know, you can take the alternate route down to Wilcox and up uh, Lincoln that way and then on to Conorock or uh, one of the other alternate routes there. So please keep that in mind as well. All right. Any other announcements? Uh, that I'm forgetting. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So uh, with that list uh, of the calendar we're talking about for the widows, widowers, shut-ins, uh, there is a list of those folks out there next to the calendar so you can sign up to go visit particular people, that kind of thing. Uh, and so that list is out there as well. All right. Any other announcements? If you have your Bible, turn with me to Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1, we'll be reading verses 9 through 20 tonight as we look at this thought of praying for one another. Praying for one another. Colossians chapter number 1, verse number 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and a desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Father, I pray now that you just have your way in our service here tonight. Father, how I thank you for each and every person that's here in the sanctuary. I know we've got several people downstairs with the children. I uh, heard it sound like they were having a really good time right before service tonight. Father, I pray you'd bless their efforts as they're there with the, uh, with the children and teaching. Father, I pray that you'd watch over each and every person tonight, even as they travel home. But Father, how I thank you for their efforts in being here uh, tonight, those that are watching via live stream and, and YouTube. Father, I pray that the message would touch them and be an encouragement to them as well. Have your way in each and everything that's said and done, and we'll give you the praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Now, as each year closes, I try to take time to kind of review the many blessings of God towards me personally. Uh, and, and also regarding my family and also the ministry that God has given me such uh, uh, that I'm just so blessed to actually be a part of. And for me, it's really just a wonderful way to celebrate the beginning of a new year. Uh, but I also try to find at least one area for the new year that I can improve on personally and as a pastor. And the area that God has burdened my heart with for both of those this year in regards uh, is he's burdened my heart is to is in 
basically to improve, I guess is the best way to say it, to improve my prayer life. Now, most Christians that I know are going to tell you that when it comes to prayer, they struggle uh, with different aspects of their prayer life. And the truth is, like I said, I'm no exception. Sometimes prayer can just seem to be just to put it in East Tennessee, just plain hard uh, sometimes as far as to know what to pray and how to pray and all of those kind of things. And, and many, when I've talked to people, they'll say, well, you know, if I've got a particular prayer request to pray for, like when we do uh, the prayer list on Sunday nights, if I've got a prayer list like that, I don't have a problem because I'm praying, you know, for those particular needs or anything else. But when it comes to just prayer, when it comes to conversating with Christ, when it comes or uh, with the, with the Father, Father. I struggle because I just kind of don't know where to start or how to get started and, and all of those kind of things. And one way that you can do that, that can really help your prayer life and, and keep it from becoming uh, you know, routine or keep it from becoming rote, is to pray uh, different parts of Scripture. One of the best places you can do that is the Psalms. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about where you can use the Psalms to kind of help guide your prayer life. Psalm 1 is one of my favorite Psalms, but, and, and, but since it's the first one, we'll just start there. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2 says, or verse 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, how do you take that, and how do you, can, how do you make a prayer out of that? Well, simply you can say, Father, help me to not become jaded in the way that I look at people and situations. May I see them correctly, may I see them with discernment, but recognizing what's good, recognizing what's sinful, but don't let me become bitter and angry and frustrated. Then in verses 2 and 3, it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. And his leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You can pray instead, help me to apply your truth to what I see and do in my life, and help me to be grounded in it. Make what the Word of God says of greater importance to me than what the Word of man says. Help me to be grounded and, and find my strength in your word so that my life will be a testimony for you. Then in verses 4 through 6, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Help me to remember that while sometimes it seems like unbelievers have everything going their way, that a day will come when the truth will truly come out. Help me to live in a way that when I do stand before you, I will hear you say, well done. And that's just taking that one psalm and taking the content there and turning it into a prayer. And the truth is, almost all of the psalms you can do that with. And that's 150 psalms uh, when you stop and think about it. And if you take Psalm 119, you can, you can stretch that for a long time if you just pray each eight-verse section uh, that's a part of that. And it can help your prayer life become more of a fellowship with the Father than just something you're doing by routine or doing by rote. Now, another way that you can use the Scriptures to help your prayer life is to adapt what are already prayers that are found in Scripture. And throughout the letters of Paul, for instance, like the one that we just read, you got, you'll find all kinds of prayers for all kinds of situations. And, and one thing, as I said, that God burdened my heart for about for this year was to be more intentional in how I pray for you uh, as a pastor, how I pray for each and every person that's a part of this church. And as, <coughs> excuse me, as I was looking at Paul's prayers, and like I said, there's several of them, Ephesians and other places that you'll see these prayers. As I was looking at those prayers, God showed me how this prayer in Colossians is, that, is one really that each of us can very easily pray for the rest of us uh, here at the church. Uh, the Bible talks about supplication, and that's praying for other people. And, and, and notice the important prayer request that we see here in just these verses in, first, in Colossians chapter number 1, verses 9 through 20. Notice the first request is that each of us would know God's will. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, 
do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So the first thing that we can pray for each other, and we can pray this many, you know, if you use that little prayer booklet, you can pray that for every person that's in the prayer book, is God, help my brother, help my sister know your will for their life. Now, what I love about that verse is that this request of the Apostle Paul for the Colossian believers is so incredibly specific. He prays for three, th for three things. First of all, he prays for the knowledge of God's will. But then he also prays for their wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, many years ago when I was studying, I was actually teaching on how to know God's will for your life at Emmanuel many, many years ago. And as I was studying, and I came across this little teaching tidbit that I've never forgotten when it comes to knowledge and understanding and wisdom. The first thing is that word knowledge. Now put in simplest terms, when we're praying that somebody knows, that somebody would know the will of God for their life, what we're praying is that they'll know what God wants them to do. Because obviously that's the first step. You have to know the what to even get started, all right? And that, that's exactly what the word knowledge is all about. It's the what, okay? But the truth is, even when you, you or I may have a pretty good handle on the what, we often get stuck on the how. Okay, God, you know, God's burdened my heart with this. I know this is what he wants me to do. But now that I know this is what he wants me to do, I don't know how to get started. I don't know, you know, how to make things happen. I don't know how to get things moving in the right direction. How do I take this burden and get it moving in the way that God wants it to do? And that's the idea behind this word understanding. It's not only the what, that's the knowledge of God's will. That's the what. But it's also the how. In other words, I'm not just praying, uh, Father, help Brother Sam. And I was uh, help Brother Sam know your will about this part of his life. No, I'm also praying, Father, help Brother Sam know your will about this part of his life. Give him direction on how you want it to be done so that you'll get honor and glory and that he'll have the confidence that he's in the center of your will. There is nothing that will give you more confidence about doing what God wants you to do than you having a pretty good idea of how he wants you to do it. Okay, so you've got knowledge, and then you've got the understanding. But then that brings us to this idea of wisdom. Where knowledge is the what, and understanding is the how, wisdom is the why. Is the why. How many of you have ever struggled when God burdens your heart for something? The first question that comes to mind, why does he want me to do that? Why is he giving me that burden? Why is it me and not this person or whatever else? Again, I think everybody does that at one point or another. But the key is the why is this idea of wisdom. Why is it that God wants me to do that? We see that combination of the what and the how and the why throughout Paul's letters specifically. Now, you do see it in Peter. You do see it in James. You do see it in Jude. Not so much in 1 John. 1 <laughs> John's written in a little bit of a different format. You don't see it quite as much. But you see this pattern of what and how and why in, in, in almost all of the New Testament letters. Romans chapter number 12, verses 1 and 2. The very familiar passage of Scripture as it relates to knowing God's will, since that's what we're talking about. Listen to this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's the what. Right? Present your bodies. That's what I want you to do. Holy, acceptable unto God. That's the how. Which is your reasonable service. That's the why. Why do you do it? Because it's the only it's the reasonable thing to do. If you're a child of God and God has called and God has saved you, then it's only reasonable that you're going to make to, to uh, become a living sacrifice so He can use you. All right. But then listen, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. That's the what by the renewing of your mind. That's the how that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
That's the why. So you see that throughout Paul's letters especially. It's, one of the, it's easy to find that pattern. Sometimes they may not be in exactly that order, but they're always there in some way or another. Sometimes it's the, the, the what and the why before the how. But you'll see that kind of thing throughout the letters of Paul. But the question is, why is it so important to pray for the why as well as the what and the how. Well, because it's knowing and understanding the why that will allow us to keep on keeping on when we get discouraged. We can know what to do. We can even know how to do it. But sometimes when the discouragement kicks in, it's because we're just doing it because we know that's what God wants us to do. But we may not have a good feel for the why. If we understand why we're doing the things that we're doing, it will keep us motivated when things around us aren't just falling into place exactly the way that we want them to fall into place. That's why it's so important that as we pray for one another, we need to be praying. Father, help Sister Debbie know your will about this part of her life. Give her direction on how you want it to be done so that you'll get honor and glory and that she'll have the confidence that she's in the center of your will. Give her wisdom about why that's so important and why she's the one that you've given this burden to so she'll be encouraged in the hard times. Now you think about this. As many people as we have in our church in so many different ministries, whether it's the deacons, whether it's Rama, I'm Sunday school teachers, children's church, can you imagine if we were praying for the people who we knew were in those ministries and we were praying, God, help them, give them the why. Give them that so that the, even, when it's, even when nobody shows up for class, <laughs> that they still, they're still motivated to serve you because they know why you've called them into that work. That's why we need to pray for one another and pray that we would know, each of us would know God's will. But then secondly, we see that we need to pray for one another that we'll live pleasing to the Lord. Look at verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Simply put, we need to pray for each other that our testimony would be, would be so strong that when people see us, they can't do anything but say they're just doing their best to serve the Lord. Now, and that's even when the hard times come. Think about the, the Old Testament. Think about Daniel. When the other leaders were trying to find something that they could use to trip up Daniel and remove his influence, this is what they said in Daniel chapter number 6, verses 4 and 5. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they couldn't find, no, they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. He was doing his best, and he was doing a great job, and they could not find anything that he was doing wrong. But then listen to verse 5. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Boy, isn't that a testimony. We can't trip him up because he's doing anything wrong. We're going to have to figure out how do we take his testimony for God and use that to try to hinder him. The Apostle Peter tells us basically the same thing. 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verses 11 and 12 and then later on in chapter 3 verses 15 and 16. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak, evil, uh, speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So one of the things that we need to pray when we pray for one another is we need to pray for each other's testimony that we would live pleasing to the Lord. But then thirdly, we see that we need to pray that we'd be fruitful, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, 
When you study Christ's uh, life, He makes it very plain that as we mature and grow in faith as believers that we need to be fruitful. He said in 1 John chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, and then later on in verse number 8, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, He taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, He purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. So one thing we need to pray for one another is that each one of us would be fruitful in the things that God has called us to do. And that's everything from being a parent to being a Sunday school teacher to being a grandparent to being a deacon or whatever else. It's all aspects of our life. Now here's the thing. Why do you think it's important for us to pray for the fruitfulness of of our brothers and sisters. Why is it important that we pray for the fruitfulness of others? Now, I think there's a lot of different reasons, but I believe that one key reason is that it keeps us from becoming jealous of the ministry of others. If I'm praying God blesses you in the work that you've got, then how am I going to get jealous of you because of the way God's using you? We see that again in Philippians chapter number 2, verses 1 through 4. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Paul's not saying that in verse number 4 to be a busybody. What he's saying is, in a nutshell, is he said, you be more worried about their success in their Christian walk than you're worried about your success in your own. That's what he's saying. And as we pray for each other's fruitfulness, we also need to pray that through the work that we're doing, again, in whatever area it is, whether it's as an employee or an employer, whether it's in the church, whether it's in the home, we need to pray that through whatever it is that God has given us to do, that we'll continue to learn more about God as we serve Him. As it says here in verse number 10, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. And then we see that we also need to pray that all of our brothers and sisters would have God's strength. Look at it. Verse number 11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Again, I love how practical Paul's prayer is right here. He prays, first of all, for the physical strength necessary to accomplish whatever God's will is and to maintain a godly testimony and to bear fruit. We've seen that already. And we need to do the same for one another. So we pray for strength in doing God's will. But not only that, in Ephesians chapter number 3, we see Paul pray for strength in the inner man, in the inward man, a strength that exhibits itself in a strong life of faith and a life that has a settled confidence in the love of Christ. Listen to this. This is Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So we need to pray not only for the strength to do what God's caused us to do, called us to do, but we need to be praying for one another that as we do those things, we feel more of the presence of Christ. We feel more of the love of Christ. We feel more drawn to Him in all of the things that we're doing. And we need to pray that for ourselves, and we need to pray it for one another. But notice another type of strength that's prayed for here in Colossians 1.11. Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. We need to pray for the strength to be patient and longsuffering with others. 
when we look at our churches today, and I'm not talking about this, this, this church, I'm talking about the church as a whole. When we look at our churches today, so often you find strife and, divi and division. Sometimes it's over serious things, but more times than not, it's over silly stuff. But what would happen if we literally prayed for each other, if we prayed for one another that we would be patient and long-suffering with one another, especially as we're trying to do what God would call us to do? So we're to pray for God's strength. But then in verses 11 through 20, we're to pray that we would also, in the doing of all of those things, that we would be joyful. Look at it again, verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering, with joyfulness. As we look at this last point, and I'm not going to reread these, but you can go down and see it. As you look at verses 12 through 14, we see that we should pray that each of us finds joy, first of all, in all that Christ has done for us. If you look at verses 12 and 13 and 14, it's all about what God did for us when he saved us. Surely we ought to have great joy when we think of all that Jesus did to save us. So we need to pray for each other that we would always find joy in the wonderful salvation that we've been given. As Fanny Crosby wrote in, in, in a hymn over 150 years ago, you know the verse, you know the song, Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. Near the cross, a trembling soul, love and mercy found me. There the bright and morning star shed his beams around me. Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadow o'er me. Near the cross, I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever till I reach the golden strand just beyond the river. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my ransomed soul shall find rest beyond the river. That's finding joy in what Jesus did for us when he saved us. But then if you look at verses 15, down through verse number 20, we find that not only should we find joy in our salvation, but we ought to find joy not only in that, but we ought to find it in our Savior. Verses 15 through 20 show us why we ought to find our joy in Him. Listen to this. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself by Him, I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Don't you think Jesus... Just Jesus is enough to bring us joy. And that's what we need to pray for one another, is that as we serve, whatever, again, whether it's in the home, whether it's in the job, whatever the situation, whether it's in the church, we need to pray that people would find their joy in their salvation and in their Savior because it's in the joy of the Lord that we find our strength. Father, I've shared what you'd have me to share tonight. And Father, how I thank you for speaking to my own heart as you burdened my heart to be more intentional in my prayer life for the good folks of this church. Father, I pray that as I, as I try to apply these truths to my life, looking at the other prayers of Paul and of Peter, that, Father, as I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ, as I pray for those of us in our church, that you would touch them. As we see just in this passage, give them the knowledge of your will, but not just the knowledge, but the wisdom and the understanding. Father, that you would give them joy. All of the things that we find wrapped up in these verses. Father, I, help, I pray that you would help me to pray these things in a way that, Father, they experience the truth of these verses. And Father, if we as a church 
would each pray that for every other member of our church. I can't even begin to imagine the difference that it would make in each and every one of our lives. Father, touch us, help us, encourage us, help us to pray for one another. And we'll give you the praise and glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All hearts and minds clear. All hearts and minds clear. Then hang on, those that are watching via live stream. If you're on the private side of the live stream, we'll be coming back, taking prayer requests here in just a moment. So please hang around for us with that. This coming Wednesday night, Lord willing, and from what I'm hearing, the temperatures are going to go way up, uh, at least starting by Tuesday, so we shouldn't have any trouble other than maybe raining a little bit. Uh, but we're going to finish up, Lord willing, uh, the Psalm 83 DVD. Uh, uh, talking about the, uh, that war uh, that seems to have to occur right sometime before the Battle of Gog and Magog. We're wrapping up that DVD this coming uh, Wednesday night, so come be with us uh, as we look at that and just pray that between now and then everybody stays safe. Uh, and uh, as, we'll, as we'll talk about here in more detail and during our prayer time, please remember those who've lost loved ones in the last few days uh, that God would just touch those that are uh, dealing with all kinds of situations that just pray for their strength, all right? All hearts and minds clear. Father, we love you. And once again, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house. Thank you for the truth of your word. And Father, I pray that you'd uh, be with us through the remainder of our service tonight as we take prayer requests and praises. And we're just going to give you the glory for all that you do through us and in us and for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We'll be back in just a moment.